Hello and welcome to Authentic Church. My name is Kevin Hockenberry. This is my wife, Stacy. We are the co-pastors here of Authentic Church that meets in Winter Springs, Florida. And before we get into the message, we want to give you the opportunity to give to the tithes and the offerings of Authentic Church. Click the link in the description bar. We really hope you enjoyed today's message. So we are in a series and it's called Monster, right? Um, but before I dive into the series, the, the first part, the first monster, I do want to make an announcement. Um, a couple of year, years ago when we first started Monster, we quickly realized that at the end of the series, a lot of people uh, needed help. Needed help. And so the Lord uh, quickly moved us to position ourselves to actually help the church. And we created this ministry called Authentic You. And Authentic You really exists, um, it, re it really exists to be, uh, come alongside you guys and to help you journey through the stuff that you go through. You ever been in a, a sermon and just all this stuff comes out and then you don't know what to do with it after? Well, Authentic You has classes and we want to help you go, uh, when you're going through stuff, we want to journey this life out with you. And so uh, right now we're in a class, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. So that class is, it's too late to join that one in this session. But we have a new one coming up. Um, it's the second time around, but it's Boundaries in Marriage. Amen. <laughs> it starts November 7th. This is for single people, people that have been divorced, married people, engaged people. Um, if you just want to learn, okay, just because the word marriage is in there doesn't mean that disqualifies you from learning, okay? Because there are concepts and principles all throughout scripture um, that we can all relate to, amen? So Boundaries in Marriage starts November 7th and it's pretty cool. We have a biblical, a professional biblical counselor that leads that class. And so she's going to help, um, help you from a professional space, but also a biblical space. Because we say this often, I don't care how many tools you give me, if you don't give me Jesus, it means nothing, right? So we're, we're not about the, the 17 tools to get you to a better whatever. This is about walking this out the way God wants us to walk out our lives, amen? Well, welcome to the first part of our Monster series. Monster started a couple of years ago um, after it was clear to us that God wanted us to take Authentic Church, the church that you are in um, right now. He wanted us to lead this church in emotional and spiritual health. And if you've been here long enough, you have heard us say those words, right? You've heard that. And um, we chose Monsters for this series. And we've gotten some flack for, for using Monsters, but we're, we weren't going to bow, bow to that. We, we really wanted to use Monsters because of this. Um, we wanted to de depict the ugliness of sin. So if I had rainbows and unicorns on the screen, well, uh, <laughs> yay. No, that's not what this is. Sin is ugly. And so we chose monster, uh, monsters to depict the ugliness of sin. So this series is not a cool series. This wasn't a, a, a series that we said, let's do this because we want to be known. But we said, let's do this series to make Jesus known, right? Because when we make Jesus known, everything else falls into place. There's purpose and a plan. Amen? Amen. But Monster does expose some hard truths. And if you were here the first uh, time around or even the second time around, you probably were in some of those sermons and were like, oh, I hate this church. And I, I'm, I'm for sure because some people visited and then never came back. And so we pray conviction right now in the name of Jesus, wherever they are, Father, that you would bring them back to you, God. Specifically this church, because we're trying to get out this building. Amen. Amen. But let's be honest. Let's be honest. Can we be honest in this place? Okay, if you know me, I hate lying and I'm a little bit too honest sometimes. But let's be honest, exposing ourselves, becoming vulnerable to the unhealthy parts in us isn't necessarily comfortable, right? It, 
It's not something that comes easy. No one wants to be told that they have an anger problem that's wreaking havoc in their home. No one wants to hear that because that's uncomfortable. No one wants to be exposed to the fact that the way we're living is actually contrary to God's plan for our life. No one freely signs up to be exposed to the possibility that the problem might not be your wife or your husband. The problem might actually be you. And that's uncomfortable because I like to, I, I, I don't like to feel uncomfortable. It's easier to say, oh, you done did me dirty and wrong and we're just gonna live in that. But flip the switch, ah, oh, it's harder, right? The monster series isn't the, isn't the easiest series to sit through, but, it, but it's worth it, right? It, it's worth it. We have seen some incredible fruit come from the last couple of um, seasons, series. A few years ago, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and it's a very close friend of mine, and we, um, we were talking for a couple of hours, and I was having some, some issues and I was trying to figure out some stuff and my mind was playing tricks on me and, you know, things were just kind of heavy, right? And my friend sat there like a good friend and she listened. Get a friend that can listen. If they do all this, she sat there, she listened. And I said, well, what do you have to say? And she said that that's the worst thing if you got a friend that's willing to hurt your feelings in order to free you. She said this, Stacy, you keep going back to the same thing that they did to you. At what point are you going to let them out from the prison of forgiveness you've created? And then she said this, nasty, they aren't the problem anymore. Your inability to forgive is. I didn't like that. I didn't ask her for all that, but she gave it to me. And it was in that moment, I was able to see things a little bit more clear. That I was living with unforgiveness and that God needed to take me on a journey of forgiveness. It didn't mean that the people that hurt me, and I've said this so many times, it didn't mean that the people that hurt me didn't hurt me. Me forgiving them doesn't magically erase the thing they did. But it does free me from bitterness. It does free me from being in my own prison. And so I'm asking you today, just like I sat in that tension while she's telling me this, I'm asking you today, would you sit in the tension long enough this morning and in the next several weeks to receive a word from the Lord? Are you willing to sit in the tension just long enough to hear what our Heavenly Father has to say? Are you? Because God wants us to enjoy an intimate relationship with Him. He does. God wants us to enjoy an intimate relationship with him. And if you are taking notes or if you have your phone, there's going to be some stuff on there. Thank you. Can you take the cap off? Ain't no way. Ain't no way, brother. Thank you. What are we doing here? We're going to go this way. All right. Amazon.com. We need a table. So God wants us to enjoy an intimate relationship with him. That means he is a good father. That means he is a good daddy. And he wants to be with us. But intimacy requires being vulnerable. Right? It requires being honest. Because when we get honest and face the things that harm our relationship with him, we really can experience Christ in a deep way. We get to experience the beauty of who he is, of his, of his grace and his love. So if we sit in attention long enough, it's not to make us 
so uncomfortable to a point where we just fall to pieces and we would, we're never going to be able to pick ourselves back up. He places us, he positions us in order for us to need him. And so if you are in a position today that you feel uncomfortable, man, sit in that for a little bit because that God is positioning you to need him right now. See, this series is called Monster. This is the last series. This is series three. We had a couple of monsters, like what's lurking in your relationships? What was lurking in you? And today it's monster, what's lurking in the what? In the church. And I'm not talking about the church building because we know what's lurking in the church building. There's some cockroaches. We know what's lurking in the church building. There's lots of cobwebs. But the Lord, God willing, when we get our own place, we will have a cleaning team. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. But we are renting this spot. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the cobwebs and the people. But what's lurking in the church, Big C Church, meaning us? Us, we're the church. In order for us to be the church, God is calling us to be a church that doesn't hide in the darkness. We need to be open to God exposing us. And it's okay for God to expose us because God is safe. There may be some people in your life that are not safe. Maybe you grew up in homes that were not safe. Maybe mom and dad were not safe or a friend was not safe or a spouse was not safe. But God is safe. So when he exposes us, if you know me, you know that I've said this 300 times. Because God is safe, when he exposes us, he exposes us to get us to a place of a deeper encounter with him. Never to harm us. Our feelings might be hurt. We might be a little bit offended. So as a church, we need to know this. We are called to live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Allowing Christ to transform us. See, this series, and I said this in, series, uh, in season one, this series isn't about modifying your behavior. It's not about giving you the tips to a better you. You can have that. It's about being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why this series exists. It's about surrendering to Christ where we say this, do what you need to do in me in order for me to live the life you have called me to, a holy and righteous life. Many of us come, um, there may be some people in this room that have come to Jesus and they thought, well, I'm just going to stop there. Yes, that is the most important decision you will ever make in your life is to come to Christ. Literally, not even the spouse you pick. The most important decision is if you are wanting to follow Christ, if you choose Christ. But we can't stop there. Sometimes we get this mentality that we don't have to address things. We don't have to address our addictions or lies or pain or our manipulative weight, whatever. Whatever we have dealt with, just fill in the blank. But we need to deal with the things that the enemy will try to use against us to get us to go back to our old ways. Just because we come to Jesus doesn't mean kumbaya, my love. Kumbaya. I wish, I wish I could sit in kumbaya. But when you come to Jesus, it's a journey. As much as Jesus wants us, the enemy of our soul wants us. And so those plans start being made to destroy you. But now we have Jesus. There's a scripture in Ephesians, and, and Ephesians was written to, to a Christian community in Ephesus, but it's going to be on the screen. This is an important scripture, and it's in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, and we're going to read it here. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off 
your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Your word speaks for itself. I don't have to add anything to it. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful ways. But we cannot put off our old self if we believe our old self didn't exist or it's not a problem. If we don't recognize this was a problem, then we, we, we cannot put our old self to death. And the verse is, this verse is very clear because sometimes we can make excuses for our poor spiritual habits and our sinful ways. See, when we come to God, he makes us new. But there is this temptation to go back to our old ways. That is why it's so important for us to become aware of our stuff. So we will not be fooled to go back to it. Because we know what it looked like. And the enemy will tempt us to want to go back to our old ways. But if we never recognize it, if we don't look at it for what it is, we will miss it. There's this, um, when I first came to know the Lord, I, about 20 three years in a relationship with, with God, knowing who he is. When I first came to know the Lord, um, I had a lot of, just a lot of stuff. I had a lot of um, things that I was a part of and not to go into too many details because we don't have a lot of time. But I, there were things that after I came to know Jesus that I quickly said to myself and to the Lord, I have to remove myself from these spaces. And I remember the first time I, I, I prayed and I was on, it was in this uh, youth ministry space and I was, I don't know, 18 years old, 19 years old, something like that. And I was kneeling down and I asked the Lord, I don't, I said, I don't know even if I'm talking to someone that is real, but I know that I'm feeling something right now and I, and I want to follow you. And so, Please make yourself known and please help me not go back to my old ways. And sometimes we can say, well, Jesus, take the wheel and you're just going to magically not lead me astray. But it was in that moment I knew I had to make choices about the things that were keeping me away from the Lord. If I wanted the Lord, I needed to to leave these spaces. I needed to leave certain people. I had a youth leader come up to me. She was my mentor for years. Her name was Melissa Yan. She's a lot. So extra. And I needed her in my life. Because she told me, Mama, she's Colombian. Mama. This was back in, in beeper times. Does anyone know what a pager is? I used to wear a beeper with a little chain. Okay. That was a thing. And it wasn't only for drug addicts or drug dealers. It was for like people like me. Where you had to ha carry change. Because if someone paged you, you had to pull over, take the quarter out, and go to a pay phone. Pay phone, anybody in this place? Okay. So that, that's a thing. It's not a thing anymore. That it's, <laughs> pay phones are actually in museums now. Did you know that? So there's, there's that. Um, but this particular woman told me, Stacy, in order for you to get what you're praying for, you, you know that like God doesn't magically just, oh, poof, <laughs> Cinderella. Like you have to make some hard choices here. And she said, I'm going to make it for you. Hand over your pager. What? <laughs> All the stuff is on my pager. The, my connections to my old boyfriend were on that pager. My connection to some connections that I, that I used to, to feel better about myself were connected to that pager. Life was connected to that pager. And she said, hand it over because that is not your life anymore. 
You have to choose different. And so I chose different. And you know, I have, I have been called in my Christian walk like legalistic or you follow the rules too much. It's not about being legalistic or following the rules too much. It's about that I know, that I know, that I know. If I look to the left, to my old ways, I will be tempted to go back. And I choose Jesus. Even when I'm the only fool in the building choosing him. So I don't refrain from certain things or activities because I'm holier than thou. It's because I know my sinful ways. And I cannot be so fooled to say, oh, Jesus got it. He absolutely has covered it with the blood of Jesus. But I ain't no fool. You're not going to catch me slipping. I'm not going over there. When we come to Christ, we're to have a, a different mindset. You know, the verse 23 says, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Because the mindset of this is what I struggle with and it is what it is. It's not a mindset made new. It's a mindset who has limited the power God has to transform us. It's also a mindset that leaves room for the enemy of our soul to regain access in the areas we haven't given over to God. To continue in our old ways over and over again, thinking that God will always forgive us is a dangerous, dangerous way to live because it cheapens the grace God has for us. We must not confuse or interpret God's grace in our life as permission to remain in our sinful behavior. This is what Monster is about. We must not confuse or interpret God's grace in our life as permission to remain in our sinful behavior. God, call it out in us so we can put it to death. Amen. Too many of us make the mistake of cheapening God's grace in our life, and then we, re we, we struggle, and we say, I don't hear God. I don't hear God, man. There's so much struggle. I'm dealing with all this and that, and my mind is this and that. Maybe you need to check yourself just for a second and ask the Lord, have I cheapened your grace, Father? Have I cheapened your grace? And if I have, would you forgive me? And guess what about the God that we're talking about today? He says, absolutely, daughter, come. Absolutely, son, come. I forgive you. That's the beauty of the God that we serve. So today we are going, I have to set up Monster, the series. Today we're going, um, today we're going to go there. So buckle your seatbelts. There's no seatbelts here, so just pretend. Today we are asking the Lord to expose us. Do you hear that? It's a good sound system. Thank you for your generosity, y'all. Let's get it together. Let's get this church some stuff we need. Hallelujah. We're asking the Lord to renew our minds and make us new. And like I always say, God exposes us not to shame us, but to what? To free us. Today I'm going to be introducing you to the first monster in the series. And this monster can lurk in the church. Many of you may uh, be familiar with this monster because maybe you've seen it in movies. Maybe you've read it in some books. But the first monster of this series is called the Siren called the siren and remember these pictures aren't for shock value I don't care this is to show you what sin can look like when you put a face to it so what is a siren sirens are often depicted you know they're not real but sirens are often depicted as beautiful seductive and enchanting uh, people with the ability to sing mesmerizing songs their singing was believed to be so captivating that sailors and travelers at sea would be lured by their songs, leading to shipwrecks on rocky shores. Sirens have been symbolic of seduction and the dangers of succumbing to temptation, deception, and destructiveness. So why did we choose the siren? Because the siren in our faith journey is the thing that lures us to dark places. Where we fall into sin that eventually will lead us to death. The destruction of our peace, 
of our health, our spiritual health, our friendships, our mental health, our marriages. Because sirens are rarely seen, they're sneaky and they hide well until it's time for them to lure their prey to their death, to their destruction. And the church can sometimes be the perfect place to hide. So we need to call it out. Amen? You see, if we aren't careful, we can be easily lured. We can be easily lured, sometimes without even knowing until it's too late. And the reason why we may have not known it was destroying us or it's like a thing is because we've ignored it long enough that we don't even see it as what it is. The sirens in our faith can hide its ugly face until it's time to strike. This series is going to be a warning to the church. And I don't mean authentic church. Yes, I do, but I mean church as a whole. And this isn't the first time the church has been warned. It has, uh, there have been warnings in the past. And we're going to see it in scripture. The Apostle Paul wrote several letters warning the church of several things that if the church wasn't careful, they would fall prey to. That means you. That means me sitting up here, standing up here with a microphone. I am no better. Things that would lure us to destruction. He warns us. And in the book of Galatians, in the Bible, Paul talks to the Galatian church and he warns them to be aware of what the, he calls the acts of the flesh. Galatians, and we're going to know what, we're going to learn about that. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, we're going to read this scripture because this is where sirens like to hide their pretty little faces. It says the act of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul calls out many things in these verses, but to fit the monster that we are in right now, we're going to tackle the first two. Hence the reason why Pastor Kevin said, hey, if you have, if you don't want some kids here, put them in kids' church. The first one we're going to hit today is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. We're going to talk about the things that we as humans tend to cover up. And the church isn't meant to cover anything up. On the contrary, it's a place where we should, we, we're able to come together and say, hey, I need the Lord, I need God desperately, right? Sexual immorality in the Greek means this, porneia. And it's basically a catch-all term. And it's referring to any kinds of sexual activity outside of biblical marriage. I didn't come up with this. The word of God says it. So don't come for me because I'm coming out the back. You won't even see me. Come for Jesus, not me. Any kind of sexual activity outside of biblical marriage, adultery, fornication, promiscuity, I mean the list goes on. Anything outside of of biblical marriage. And so here is where we can be a little bit uncomfortable because I'm going to come into the generation right now, into the spaces that we live now. We live very much in a culture that if we wanted to cheat on our spouse, we could do so all through an app. All through an app. If we heard the lure of the siren and we, we have needs and we and our spouse isn't fulfilling them, I can go on an app and I can find someone to fulfill a need like this. That is the culture we live in. 
And unfortunately, that culture bleeds into the church. This is why monster exists for us to say the hard truths out loud so then you can do what you want with it. If we want to sleep with someone, we can just swipe right on the latest hookup app. It's that easy. We live in a social media hookup world. Slide into someone's DM for some quick validation and maybe a quick meetup. Paul's warned, he warned the church, and we need to warn each other now in 2023. We look for things to fill our desires. There are so many things out there that try to fill these, these earthly desires. There are apps and websites and OnlyFans and all these things. Yes, I said that out loud in church from a pulpit on a microphone. Because if I'm not going to say it, someone else will, and they'll invite you to a space that you don't even need to be a part of. So let's just get real. Run from that nonsense. Because there is a part in that scripture we're going to get to, and it's at the end here. The warning wasn't because it had the potential to maybe destroy us. The warning came because he knew that as Christ followers, we are called to live a pure life before God. Not a perfect life. Very different. And he knew that if they turned to sexual morality, they would be destroyed. If they listened to that siren long enough, they would be lured. And this is the verse that we can go a little bit deeper. It's verse 21. It says that those people that are are like that list that I just read to you, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sexual immorality has consequences. It does. There's no room for side pieces in the kingdom of God. There's no room for side pieces for sons and daughters of the Most High. If we have a need for a side piece, it goes much more deeper, sis. It goes much more deeper, brother. We are trying to fulfill a need that only Christ can fulfill. And we keep going out in these streets trying to find things to fill us. And God's like, no, no, not there. Come here. I can fill you. The second part, this is going fast. I'm so sorry. It's Second part to that scripture was impurity. And I think sometimes we can, oh, I'm not impure or I'm good or whatever. Let's. Let me break down what um, impurity in the Greek means, what this is actually saying. And in the Greek, it means the word akarthavseya. And it refers to any kind of uncleanliness of our thoughts, our words, and actions. Thoughts that are motivated by lust or greed or excess. I said we were going to be real, right? I'm with you. If I was, I'd rather be sitting in that seat. (laughs) I'd rather hand the microphone over to another preacher. But if you, if I don't tell you in this moment, then I've missed the opportunity and I've disobeyed God. I don't want to pay that consequence. Thoughts that are motivated by lust, greed, or excess. Yes, we're saying this from the pulpit. Pornography. And sometimes we can go straight to the the boys, to the men. No, both men and women. Both men and women. See, pornography produces unclean thoughts and, and behavior. And now while watching pornography may not involve direct physical engagement with the person, it's important to say this out loud, that it has some pretty daggone significant implications. It affects your mental health. Look look it up. I didn't come up with this. Like, look it up. It affects your mental health. It affects your relationships. It can attribute, it can be attributed to addictions. And this, 
It promotes unrealistic and objectifying views of sex. Something that God created to be good and holy and pure. Not messy and dirty. I've sat um, with several couples before. I've been in ministry for a long time and I've heard a lot of, of things. And we, we've had to process um, in some of the couples that I've met with the harm and the effects of, of pornography, the effects that pornography had on their marriage. Because in, instead of living out their marriage with healthy expectations of sex, pornography placed an unhealthy expectation on one of the people in the marriage that didn't even know they had to meet. And so now there's a struggle. Do you see how the sirens come really sneaky? You don't, when you get married, you don't even think that this is the thing that might destroy you. Matthew 5, 27 and, and verse 28 says, this is going to be on the screen. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This goes for women as well. See, Jesus is emphasizing the importance of not just external actions, but also the thoughts and desires of the heart. Because it's not the first look that he's talking about. Because things will catch our attention. But if it catches our soul, we will be a prisoner to it. What about, let's talk about scrolling through social media, looking at people we shouldn't be looking at in ways that cause us to have lust or envy or jealousy or hatred in our heart. Let's talk about what the Greek meaning of impurity is. Let's go a little bit deeper and it's, Impure words. Sometimes we think, well, impure, I'm not, I'm not sleeping around, or I didn't cheat on my husband or my wife or whatever, so I'm good. But let's talk about impure words. We have to be real careful with that. And the siren, that monster, that siren monster, man, that thing is real sneaky because words you hear that appeal to you and make you feel some type of way that is contrary to God's plan, we have to be careful. This can be the voice of someone you know you shouldn't be around, but you like the way they make you feel with the things they say. Knowing that the things they are saying will lure you into spaces you shouldn't be in. This can look like a married person listening to the voice of someone who isn't their spouse that creates this intimate feeling that really should only be shared between a husband and a wife in the confines of marriage. But we, but we say, maybe your husband wasn't paying attention to you, filling up your marriage love tank. And someone else comes along and it feels good for the moment, so you went for it. Or your wife isn't paying you attention, so you fall prey to the things Paul warned the church about. Guys, this is real stuff. And if you're honest, some, a lot of us could relate to something, right? I can't be the only one up here saying, hoo -hoo, me, y'all. And you, you justify it. We can justify it because we're not being physical with the person. Hmm. What about impure thoughts? They can look like the fantasies we entertain in our minds. The fantasy of life being different than the one we have. The problem with fantasy is the life you fantasize about either belongs to someone else or is contrary to God's will for you. You fantasize about another life you could have instead of being a good steward of the life you already have. And so... When we remain in fantasy land, we can, be, we can get ourselves in trouble. Sirens are sneaky and they have a beautiful way to lure us, both men and both women. But do not be, be deceived because not everything that makes you feel good in the moment is necessarily good for you for the future. 
And everyone in this room can attest to that. Everyone. Not everything that makes us feel good in the moment is necessarily good for us in the future. So our prayer needs to be, Jesus, help us recognize a siren in our life. I do have to hurry this up. Close this up. But I was talking to my husband about this, and he's like, you need to share this story. I was like, really? I had, I was, uh, before my husband, before I came to Jesus, I had this really long relationship with someone. And to the point that we, I mean, this, this person wanted to marry me, right? And I was about four or five years into marriage. And I, I'm married 22 years now. And I was about four or five years into marriage. And I remember it was, re- it was a real struggle because no one taught me that he was not, my husband was not responsible for every, for my happiness. I really wasn't taught that um, he wasn't the enemy of everything. That there, there literally is stuff in my life that I need to address. And if I always place it on him, I always place it on him, I never, nothing ever changes. And so in my immature ways, I, I was, man, I was overworked. I was exhausted. And there was just this space of like, man, I just, I'm, I'm not getting full. And I get an email from this guy four or five years into marriage, my old boyfriend that wanted to marry me. We planned it all out. And I get this email and basically telling me, hey, man, I, how you doing? I really miss you. That's what sirens do. They get you in the moment where you you need something. And if it could look like the thing that can fulfill you, you'll bite. But here's the deal. I remembered years prior, kneeling down, asking the Lord, hey, help me to never go back to my old ways. And so I answered the email stupidly. Oh, how you doing? And then as I pressed enter, I got sick. And the Holy Spirit said, do not entertain your old ways. Because you think it's a cute little simple email, but this will be the destruction of your marriage. And you know what I did? I was in my office. I worked for a ministry. I was in my office. I got up and I got, guess who I worked with? Melissa, the mentor that told me, give me your pager, girl. She was a teacher in the place that I was at. And I ran to her and I said, Melissa, I'm not trying to lose anything. I love my husband, but it's greater than that. I don't want to lose this connection to the father. Because once I lose that, then I lose everything else. And she said, give me, give me your laptop. It's not give me your laptop. You got to walk over to the computer because it was this big monitor and big buttons. It was like a whole thing. It was like AOL.com. There was no sliding in the DMs back then. It was sliding into your at AOL.com. And so you had to wait. So I have receipts. Last night I looked at the email because you could pull it up. That junk don't go away. But that's what monsters in our life do. They don't go away. We just have to recognize it for what they are. The deeper we are hidden in Christ, the clearer we can see the sirens call for what it is, a trap. I know we have, give me two more minutes. When we are not hidden in Christ, the easier the easier it is to lure us in and, in and fall prey to the things Paul warns us against. There's a scripture in Colossians 3 that says, put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature. See, this verse is so important as a Christ follower because as a Christ follower, uh, um, we are called to put to death the things that separate us from God. There was this uh, man in the Bible, David, and he famously defeated Goliath. But he faced a different kind of giant that proved to be even more challenging to conquer. The giants of sexual immorality. See, but the interesting is, thing is, this is the God we serve. 
The thing is that God calls David a man after his own heart. So how? Why? Because his heart was a heart of repentance. And God looks at our heart, not our behavior. So once your heart begins to transform, behavior just starts following. So if you're struggling today, if you have entertained the monster, it's time to put it to death right now. How do we put to death the things that separate us from God? I've got a lot, but we're going to end right here because this sentence right here just wraps it all up. How do we put to death the things that come for us? We need to learn to fall in love with Jesus. Do you know that Jesus is more than a Sunday morning fix? Do you know that he is a God, the creator, that God our Father is the creator of all things and that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us, for the garbage that would keep us from inheriting the kingdom? Isn't that beautiful? As much tension that you're sitting in and being uncomfortable, when we're talking about sexual morality and impurity, we serve a God that says, but I can free you. Let's pray. Let's stand up. If you're physically able, let's stand up. And let's just raise our hands. Let's put our, our raise our hands, our, our palms. Let's put our palms up, please. Jesus invites us to the Christian life to enjoy a, a, a rich life with him. God wants all of us. Are you willing to give him all of you this morning? Are you willing to give him all of you. Bow your heads, please. If that is you, if you are willing, man, I want every area. I'm not, we're not even talking about sexual morality. And, man, let's go even further. Anything in my life, if you just want all of Jesus, would you raise your hand right now? I want, I'm raising my hands myself. I want all of you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the hands that are raised. Can I talk to the people that have their hands raised? You are serving and recognizing a God that can transform your life. He is calling you to live a righteous and holy life. For when he comes, he can see his bride has no stains. But he, what he's not doing is calling us to a life of perfection and performance. He's calling us to a life of surrender, so let's surrender to him. Father, we thank you. We love you. We welcome you into every space. Search our hearts, Father. Search our hearts, Father. We're gonna dismiss, I'm gonna say amen. We're gonna dismiss, but they're gonna continue playing in the back gently. And if you want prayer, can you please come up? I'm going to have some prayer workers come right now. Come to the front. And if you need prayer, can you come forward? If not, I love you. I pray a hedge of protection over you. I pray the blood of Jesus over you, over every relationship in your life. May you walk with Jesus. May you see Jesus in a new light. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed, but we will be up here for a couple more minutes.